Definition. This guidance was developed within the efficacy. Implementation Working Group of the International Conference on Harmonization of Technical Requirements for Registration of Pharmaceuticals for Human Use, IC, and has been subject to Consultation by the Regulatory Parties, in accordance with the IC process. 2. Introduction. Since the IC E3 guidance was made final, experiences implementing the guidance in the IC regions have given rise to requests for clarification. This question and answer Q&A document is intended to facilitate implementing the ICI-3 guidance by clarifying key Questions issues. and answers. 3. A. Content and structure. Questions number 1. Some in the pharmaceutical industry have expressed concern that the ICI-3 guidance, structure and content of clinical study reports, ICI-3, is intended as a requirement, i.e., a template that must be followed. The fact that the ICI-M4 guidance for the common technical document, CTD, refers to specific structural Elements described in ICI-3, e.g., Clinical Study Report, CSR, Section Headings, may have contributed to this interpretation. Interpretation of ICI-3 as a rigid template can result in presentation of redundant and suboptimal information in CSRs. This is a particular problem when ICI-3 is used for studies for which it was not designed, e.g., pharmacokinetic studies are studies with health economic or quality of life outcomes. Can IC reaffirm that IC E3 is a guidance and not a required template and that IC E3 can be adapted to report studies that fall outside the original scope of IC E3? Answer 1. Yes. IC E3 is a guidance, not a set of rigid requirements or a template, and flexibility is inherent in its use. The guidance is intended to assist sponsors in the development of a report that is complete, free from ambiguity, well organized, and easy to review. Modifications and adaptations to the structure presented in the guidance that lead to better display and communication of information are encouraged. The introduction to ICI-3, page 3, clearly indicates that ICI-3 is to be interpreted as a guidance, not a set of requirements. Each report should consider all of the topics described, and less clearly not relevant, although the specific sequence and grouping of topics may be changed if alternatives are more logical for a particular study. Some data in the appendices are specific requirements of individual regulatory authorities and should be submitted as appropriate. The numbering should then be adapted accordingly. It should be noted that ICI-3 was developed for SUBME. Question of adequate and well. Controlled clinical effectiveness studies. Nevertheless, the basic principles described can be applied to other kinds of trials, such as clinical pharmacology studies and open-label. Safety studies, recognizing that not all sections or data presentations may be appropriate or important for these other types of trials. Sponsors are encouraged to adapt the recommendations in the guidance as appropriate, e.g., by deleting sections that are not relevant or adding important sections that are not mentioned in the guidance. Questions number 2. The IC E3 guidance provides limited guidance on the synopsis. In the IC M4E guidance, additional guidance on the synopsis of a CSR is given, including its use as a standalone document and its length. Although ICI-3 asks for a usual maximum length of three pages, ICM-4E extends this page limit for more complex and important studies, e.g., to ten pages. How should both guidances be read together? Answer 2. The recommendations made in the ICI-3 guidance, which was developed before ICM-4E, should be combined with the suggestions made in the M4E guidance. Because the synopsis will be used as a standalone document within a common technical document, it should be written so that it can be understood and interpreted on its own, i.e., without the other sections of a CSR. In addition to a brief description of the study, design and critical methodological information, the synopsis should provide efficacy and safety results, as well as other critical information, including d. Auto on the study population, disposition of subjects, important protocol deviations, and treatment compliance. Cross-references to other sections of the CSR should be avoided. As explained in ICM 4E, complex or large and important studies may call for a synopsis longer than three pages. The 10-page example given in M 4E is not an absolute requirement or limit but should not need to be exceeded greatly. The use of a tabular format for the synopsis is not mandatory. B. Appendices. Question number 3. The CSR appendices described in the ICI-3 guidance include material now available in the trial master file. TMF, in accordance with ICI-6. 
Should documents available in the TMF be included in the CSR appendices? Answer number 3. Documentation needed to review the CSR should be included in the CSR appendices. It is not sufficient for such documents to be included only in the TMF which is not submitted in the marketing application. Documents that provide critical information on a study, such as the protocol 16.1.1, statistical methods. 16.1.9, list of investigators and study sites, and sample case report forms, would always be needed by reviewers assessing a study and should be included in the trial report even if they are in a TMF. Certain documents may be required for the CSR by individual countries or regions, in which case they should be included. For example, according to the IC Guidance C6 Good Clinical Practice, Consolidated Guidance, and Audit Certificate, 16.1.8, should be provided when required by applicable law or regulation. If there is any uncertainty about whether documents should be included or not, the appropriate regulatory agency can be consulted. Supportive documents, such as Investigator Curricula Vitae, Ethics Committee Approvals, Informed Consent forms, and batch numbers per subject are in the TMF or clinical supply database and should generally not be included in the CSR appendices. Any documents not submitted and subsequently requested by the regulatory authority should be provided promptly. Question number 4. How can I include data not mentioned in the IC E3 text or appendices since the guidance predates the IC M4 guidance associated with the CTD and Electronic Common Technical Document ECTD? Specifically, what are the options for submission of data for topics such as pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, pharmacogenomics, genomic markers, gene therapy, stem cells, biomarkers, devices, quality of life, assay, validation, data monitoring, review committees, electrocardiogram, other safety reports, images, pictures, scans, diagnostic tests for individualized therapy, and patient reported outcomes. Answer number 4. It is appropriate to create new headings in the CSR and new appendices for these topics. The guidance provides for and focuses on efficacy and safety variables known at the time. Other topics should be well referenced in the CSR body and clearly identified in the table of contents. Current submission options include 1. Standalone reports. These can be placed in P. Arlal with the main clinical study report in the ECTD. For example, a clinical pharmacology study might have the clinical study report, a pharmacokinetic report, and an assay validation report. For an efficacy study with patient reported outcome, pro, measures, there might be a pro report. Each of these reports can be referenced under the same heading in the ECTD and placed alongside one another in the ECTD folder for that study. The nature of the information should be clearly described in the title of the document that is provided through the ECTD. Two. Study tagging files. In a region where study tagging files are used, it is recommended that a file tag option from the valid values list be used, for example, safety report, antibacterial, special pathogen, C. Specifications for study tagging files, http colon slash slash www.ic.org slash products slash electronic dash standards dot html closing parenthesis. Alternatively, if a file tag that adequately describes the material you are planning to submit is not available, you can request th. Add a new file tag be made available. This request should be submitted to your regional authority. In the event that this change cannot be accommodated within your time frame, you can place the document with the main body of the report, i.e., the document would be tagged with the study report body. File tag. The nature of the information should be contained in the title of the document that is provided through the ECTD. Please refer to the most recent version of the valid values list, as it is periodically updated as changes are requested. C. Terminology. Q5. A subject's death could potentially be captured in two separate data listings. A. The listing referenced in section 12.3.1.1, deaths. This section calls for sponsors to include a listing of all deaths during the study including the post-treatment follow-up period, and deaths that resulted from a process that began during the study. b. The listing referenced in section 12.3.1.2, Other Serious Adverse Events. This section defines other serious adverse events as events other than death but including the serious adverse events temporally associated with or preceding the deaths. There is concern that including events with fatal outcomes in section 12.3.1.2 may lead to double counting or miscounting of deaths. Can. 
This issue be clarified. A5. It is true that the structure and definitions provided in the IC E3 guidance could result in deaths appearing in section 12.3.1.2, as per E3 numbering, other serious adverse events, if an event terminated with, or was associated with, a subject's death. However, this should not result in double counting or miscounting of deaths. Although deaths may or may not be included in the listing for section 12.3.1.2, all Deaths should be captured in the listing for section 12.3.1.1. That is, any subject death reported under section 12.3.1.2 as an other serious adverse event with a fatal outcome would also have been captured under deaths in section 12.3.1.1. Q6, section 12.2.2 of the IC E3 guidance states that all adverse events occurring after initiation of study treatments should be displayed. In summary tables. The example table in section 12.2.2 of IC E3, adverse events, number observed and rate, with subject identification, is really a listing that will rarely be brief enough to place in the body of the study report. Moreover, in addition to severity, relatedness, and subject identifiers, shown in the example table, each adverse event should include the original investigator's verbatim term. How is it possible to include all of this information in a summary table? Can this table be modified? A6, the body of the clinical study report, IC E3 section 12.2.2, should include a summary table of relatively common adverse events. Those occurring in at least a particular percentage of subjects who received the investigational drug. This summary tabulation compares treatment and control groups and does not include subject identifying numbers or verbatim adverse event terms. Of note, the example table provided in section 12.2.2 of the guidance is not meant to be presented in section 12.2.2 of the report but in section 14.3.1, which is not part of the text of the clinical study report. Kant. The IC E3 guidance did not attempt to display all possible presentations of adverse event information, but rather outlined the summary table intended for section 12.2.2 and provided an Illustration of the far more detailed display that would be placed in section 14.3.1. The example, provided for section 14.3.1, however, does not try to illustrate all possibilities, but shows individuals with adverse events by body system, severity, and perceived drug-relatedness for treatment group X. Listings should also display investigators' verbatim terms for each event, and could be used to show demographic or disease-specific information, dosage duration of treatment, or treatment cycle, for cancer chemotherapy. Because it can be impractical to display all of this information in a single listing, such analyses can be presented in individual listings, e.g., by dose or other subgroup of interest. When adverse event data are presented by subgroup, however, a display of overall adverse event, for example, for a drug for subjects with chronic kidney disease, adverse events could be tabulated separately for subjects receiving or not receiving dialysis. But a table that includes adverse events in all subjects should also be included. The listings that provide more comprehensive adverse event information, specifically subject identifiers and verbatim terms for each adverse event, should be provided in the study report, in sections 14.3.1 and 16.2.7. If each adverse event is to be characterized extensively, i.e., many items in the listing, electronic approaches may be appropriate. Question number 7. Section 10.2 of the IC E3 guidance requests an accounting of important protocol deviations. However, the flowchart in Annex EVA of IC E3, Disposition of Patients, recommends that data be provided on the number of subjects withdrawn from the study because of protocol violations. Neither the term, protocol deviations, nor, protocol violations, has been previously defined by IC. What is the distinction between a protocol deviation, important protocol deviation, and a protocol violation. Can these terms be clarified? In addition, does the guidance provide for sponsors flexibility in defining what constitutes an important protocol deviation for a trial? Answer 7. A protocol deviation is any changed divergence or departure from the study design or procedures defined in the protocol. Important protocol deviations are a subset of protocol deviations that might significantly affect the completeness, accuracy, and or reliability of the study data are that might significantly affect a subject's rights, safety, or well-being. For example, important protocol deviations might include enrolling subjects in violation of key eligibility criteria designed to ensure a specific subject 
population are failing to collect data necessary to interpret primary endpoints, as this may compromise the scientific value of the trial. Protocol violation and important protocol deviation are sometimes used interchangeably to refer to a significant departure from protocol requirements. The word violation can also have other meanings in a regulatory context. However, in Annex EVA of the IG3, to mean only a changed divergence or departure from the study requirements, whether by the subject or investigator, that resulted in a subject's withdrawal from study participation. Whether such subjects should be included in the study analysis is a separate question. To avoid confusion over terminology, sponsors are encouraged to replace the phrase protocol violation in Annex EVA with protocol deviation, as shown in the example flowchart. Below, sponsors can also choose to use another descriptor, provided that the information presented is generally consistent with the definition of protocol violation provided above. The ICI-3 guidance provides examples of the types of deviations that are generally considered important protocol deviations and that should be described in section 10.2 and included in the listing in appendix 16.2.2. The definition of important protocol deviations is determined for a in part by study trial. design, the critical procedures, study data, subject protections described in the protocol, and the planned analyses of study data. In keeping with the flexibility of the guidance, sponsors can amend or add to the examples of important deviations provided in ICI 3 in consideration of a trial's requirements. Substantial additions or changes should be clearly described for the reviewer.